think I didn't notice the extra pep in your step this morning because the sun is out. And I am, I am having that pep myself. It's wonderful. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I bid you a warm welcome to this time of worship. It is a joy and a privilege to be able to come before God, the God who is our everything, and to just lift our praise, our prayers, and our worship in all the different ways that we do that. Um, lots of things happening throughout um, the week. I want to remind um, our youth that tonight is our MYF meeting at 6.30. Come on down. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. We are going to also start talking about our mission trip this summer. I mean, it's crazy to think that we need to think about that already, but we need to think about that already. So if you um, want to remind your friends to shoot them a text and let them know that we're meeting tonight and we'll see you here at 6.30. Um, Marsha reminded me that um, it's probably time to announce the big announcement. Now, you know that we haven't been able to do Song of the Shadows for the last two years because, well, you know, the pandemic kind of put a damper on that. And we really wanted to do it this year, so we found a creative way in which we could have Song of the Shadows but be able to spread out a little more. And so Marsha arranged with um, the owners of um, Whitechapel Next Door that we would be able to use their space to host our um, Song of the Shadows event, which is an absolutely magical event, as you all know. I really pray that you will be able to come. It'll be at 8.15 like it usually is. Share the news with your family and friends, um, people who enjoy coming or people who have never been. It is really a very special thing. Um, also, if any of you would like to join the choir to participate in Song of the Shadows, um, rehearsals for that will start this week. On Thursday evenings, the choir rehearses from 7.15 to about 8.45-ish. Uh, from there, I mean, we get done what we need to get done and then we go home. But anyway, so if you would like to join, please see Marsha um, and, and talk to her and, and she can give you much more information than I can. But I, for one, am very excited because I've heard much about some of the shadows and I can't wait for us to do that. It will be a very meaningful way to spend Good Friday this year. Um, and I think, oh, uh, one other thing. <coughs> Crafting Permissions is meeting this Saturday um, from 10 to noon. If you are um, interested in finding out more about what that is, talk to Barbara Lynn. Um, and anyone is welcome. If you're not a knitter or crocheter, but you still want to come for the fellowship, do that. Um, we have always opportunities for you to sew labels to our blankets or to attach squares together. There's always extra things to do, and if you want to learn how to knit and crochet, well, these people are absolute masters of their craft, and they'd be happy to teach you. All right, and I think that is it, and with that, I will ask you now to quiet your hearts and your minds as we prepare for this time of worship with silent prayer. Mm -hmm. Pray together our opening prayer this morning as it is printed in your bulletin. Inviting God, 
Your son called all who are thirsty to come and drink of the living water that he offers. Let the rivers of living water flowing from him quench our thirst today and every day so that we may know who he is and who we are to be in him. Amen. Now, um, as we prepare to stand in body or in spirit to sing our first hymn, um, My Life Flows On. Again, this is just proof that Pastor Mar is only human. Um, it's actually hymn number 2212, not 2213. So turn to page 2212 and please stand in body or in spirit as we sing together, My Life Flows On, How Can I Keep From Singing? <laughs>
Will you pray with me? Almighty God, we have opened our hands to you, and our hands have been filled with good things. Receive the gifts we bring in gratitude for your care for us, and help us to bless you with the dedication of our lives. Through Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. Gracious God, your Son invited all who are thirsty to come and drink from the living water that flows from him. We are thirsty, O God, and we come before you this morning to ask that you fill us once more with the living water that is the source of life. By your Holy Spirit, make us into a new creation, so that as we know Jesus, we may know you and what you desire for us and from us. We pray for the church throughout the world. Lord, inspire your sons and daughters for a prophetic witness to your truth, to carry the words of life and the message of light and the good news of your salvation to all the world. We pray for the nations of the world and its leaders. Lord, overcome pride and misunderstanding and unite us in our commitment to bring abundance and wholeness to your children everywhere. We pray for your creation, our home. By your spirit, O Lord, renew the earth and make us good stewards of its resources. Teach us to enjoy its abundance rightly. We pray on this day for all those who stand in need of healing, O Lord. Send your healing spirit upon them. Restore them to health in body, mind, and spirit. Provide for their needs. And also, Lord, strengthen and encourage all those who care for them. We pray for our communities, Lord. Teach us to be good neighbors so that we may live in peace with one another and in friendship share the joys and the burdens of daily life. From the youngest to the oldest, make us nurturers so that we may grow in grace and wisdom together. In your mercy, Almighty God, receive our prayers and according to your wisdom, provide all that we need through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Hear us, O Lord, as we now pray boldly together the prayer that Jesus first taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John, and we will be reading from verse 
verse 37 through verse 52. This is the Common English Bible. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and shouted, All who are thirsty should come to me. All who believe in me should drink. As the scripture said concerning me, rivers of living water will flow out from within him. Jesus said this concerning the Spirit. Those who believed in him would soon receive the Spirit, but they hadn't experienced the Spirit yet since Jesus hadn't yet been glorified. When some of the crowds heard these words, they said, This man is truly the prophet. Others said, He's the Christ. But others said, the Christ can't come from Galilee, can he? Didn't the scripture say that the Christ comes from David's family and from Bethlehem, David's village? So the crowd was divided over Jesus. Some wanted to arrest him, but no one grabbed him. The guards returned to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked, Why didn't you bring him? The guards answered, No one has ever spoken the way he does. The Pharisees replied, Have you too been deceived? Have any of the leaders believed in him? Has any Pharisee? No, only this crowd which doesn't know the law, and they are under God's curse. Nicodemus, who was one of them, and had come to Jesus earlier, said, Our law doesn't judge someone without first hearing him and learning what he is doing. Does it? They answered him, You are not from Galilee too, are you? Look it up, and you will see that the prophet does not come from Galilee. The story of God for the covenant people of God. Thanks be to God. Almighty God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, speak to us today in the language of our hearts, that we may hear your word with understanding and answer your call with confidence. May your word come through me or in spite of me. Amen. Now I know you all saw the sermon title, and so I'm just going to go ahead and start with that. Who is Jesus? Now that seems like a silly question to ask in a church, right? We know who Jesus is. You're, you're, I know you're all saying to me, Pastor Mark, we totally know who Jesus is. I mean, he's the Son of God, he's the Word made flesh, who made his home among us, who walks with us, he's the light that has come into the world to bring life for all people, the one in whom we become children of God and heirs to the amazing grace of God. He came to save the world, to offer us abundant life, both here and now and forever. Then why do we have to ask this question? Knowing all of this, all of these things, Right? May not be enough for us because how does that affect how I know Jesus? Knowing all this needs to change how I think about Jesus, perhaps. Who we understand Jesus to be and what we understand Jesus to be about is who we understand God to be and what we understand God to be about. To know the heart of Jesus is to know the heart of God because Jesus' purpose, he said, was to come down so that God may be known in him. So in other words, who we understand Jesus to be matters for how we live out our faith in him. Now in our passage today, who is Jesus? Seems to be the question of the hour, and not just in the part that we read, but throughout chapter 7. People are deeply divided. They can't quite decide what to make of Jesus. Some wonder if he's a great prophet. Maybe he's like a Moses or an Elijah. And he's come to point the way to the Messiah that is coming really soon. And others say, no, no, he is the Messiah. How can you not see that? And yet others say, well, no, he can't be the Messiah because he comes from the wrong place. He's from Galilee, and everyone knows that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem in the city of David and come from the family of David, and he's none of those things. In fact, no prophet and no Messiah will ever come from Galilee. Please, don't even think about that. Now Jesus is back in Jerusalem for the Festival of Booths. And throughout this festival, Jesus takes time to teach in the temple. Now he hadn't wanted to go to this festival in the first place. He kind of, you know, thought he'd lay low for a little bit because, you know, 
The last time he was in Jerusalem, the religious authorities got a little upset with him. Do you remember? Like he was healing a man who had been sick for 38 years, and they were not happy about that because he did it on the Sabbath. And so rather than rejoicing that he had healed the man, they were angry that he broke the rules. But Jesus went anyway. And so now he's teaching in the temple. And now unlike the Gospels of Mark and Matthew and Luke, which kind of tells us all the wonderful things Jesus taught, right? The beautiful parables, the Beatitudes, all those wonderful things. They're not in John. But we know that Jesus was still saying and teaching all these things, which is why the crowds were just hanging on his every word. And as the religious authorities hear him speaking and talking about God and who God is, even they are amazed at his knowledge of the law. Especially since, you know, this Jesus guy doesn't have any of the training and education that they have. How can he possibly know all these things? In John 7, verse 16 through 19, Jesus responds to their question of how he can know all these things. He says, my teaching isn't mine, but comes from the one who sent me. Whoever wants to do God's will can tell whether my teaching is from God or whether I speak on my own. Those who speak on their own seek glory for themselves. Those who seek the glory of him who sent me are people of truth. There is no falsehood in them. Didn't Moses give you the law? Yet you do not keep it. Why do you want to kill me? Good question, Jesus. Because, you know, that is in the law. Do not kill. That is one of the big ones, right? In the Ten Commandments, the big one. Now, the law is pretty clear about that. And Jesus goes on to point out that it's fine for someone to be circumcised on the Sabbath day, but for him to make an entire person well on the Sabbath made them so angry. And he says to them, don't judge according to appearances. Judge with right judgment. Now we may well ask, why are the, the Pharisees and the chief priests and the religious authorities so angry with Jesus? Because they're pretty angry, right? I mean, you don't want to just kill someone for kicks, right? They're actually really angry with Jesus. And perhaps it's a question of control and power. And they feel they're slipping anytime Jesus is around. They don't like that the crowds run to this peasant, this nobody from Galilee, and proclaim him wise when, when they are the wise ones. They're the ones who know all the stuff. They know the law and the scriptures, not this Jesus who had never had any formal education and training. They believe that what they know with such absolute and stubborn certainty puts them in this position of superiority over everyone else. And they look down on the crowds who they deem as gullible. Uh, they'll fall for anything and they don't know anything. They'll just go along with whatever. They're so deceived by this Jesus guy. And they would put a stop to this. And so they send the temple guards to arrest Jesus and take care of the problem, once and for all. They don't feel like they have anything at all to learn from this rabble rouser and troublemaker, this nobody from Galilee who claims he is sent from God, sent by God, the Son of God. Now, Gail O'Day, she points out that they have completely closed themselves off to allowing what they see in Jesus to perhaps maybe redefine their understanding of how God is in the world. Instead, they hold firmly to what they know. They hold firmly to what they already believe about who the Messiah will be and where he will come from and what the scriptures say about him, and that's the only thing they will ever consider. They judge only according to appearances. And Jesus does not appear to meet any of the criteria. Now, isn't this an easy trap to fall into when what we think we know so surely blinds us to God right in our midst? I mean, we're not immune to that, are we? When we decide who Jesus is based on what we would like him to be, rather than to see and to know him for who he actually is, we are not allowing ourselves to be transformed by a relationship with him, but rather we attempt to transform Jesus into what we need him to be so that we don't have to change at all. That's not what we're supposed to do. Instead, Jesus asks us to judge with right judgment, to respond to Jesus for exactly who he is 
the one who was sent by God to make God visible and knowable and accessible, and then be willing to come to him and be changed into a new creation. Ooh, we don't like that change part, right? We don't like the change, but it's good. Now on this, on this passage, it says Jesus stands up on the last and the most important day of the festival. Now, you know, we may not know much about the festival of booths, right? So I thought I would tell you a little bit about what's going on here. So the Festival of Booths is one of the three major festivals. So there's the Passover, there's the Pentecost Festival, and then there's the Festival of Booths. And in, this is a harvest festival that takes place in the fall, and it's really a joyful celebration. It's a Thanksgiving festival. They, the people gather in Jerusalem, and they will build these booths, or also huts, um, out of the branches of the palm tree, the myrtle tree, and the willow tree. And they will build these little huts, and everyone will sleep in the huts and eat in the huts to remember their time in the wilderness, um, when they lived off of the land and, and the fruits of the land. And then um, there's all these songs and scriptures and things that all go along with giving thanks to God, praying for God's provision, continued provision for the people. And then on the final day, which is the day in which Jesus jumped up, it's called um, Hoshana Rabbah, which means the great Hosanna. And so on this day, the priest will take a big golden pitcher, and all the people will follow the priest as he processes out to the Pool of Siloam. It's about 100 yards, I think, from where the temple was. I think I read somewhere. But anyway, he'll fill the pitcher with water, and they'll process back. And all the people are carrying citrus fruits in their hands, and, and one of each of the palm branches that these huts are made out of. And they'll process around the sanctuary seven times, and then they'll pour the water on the altar. And this is the time when they're praying for rain, because now the summer's been long and dry, right? So they're ready for the rain to come to nourish the fields once more so that there will be life again next year, so they'll have water to drink. We all need water to live. The plants, the people, the animals, all of us, right? The water is important. And so this is the moment at which Jesus stands up and says, Come to me, all who are thirsty. Right? He invites all who believe in him to come and drink from the rivers of living water that is flowing from within him. Jesus issues this invitation to everyone, to all who are thirsty. He says, come to me, believe in me, receive new and abundant life. All who are thirsty, come and drink. Receive the gift of faith in the bringer of life and light, truth and grace. All are welcome to come and see. And to those who will drink, they can trust that the Holy Spirit will nurture and nourish this newly found gift of faith within them to help it to grow and to take root and to establish. And that which you are praying for in this festival, right? For the life-giving presence of God, because that was part of it too. It was not just rain, but also that eventually... The life-giving presence of God will flow from Jerusalem into all the world, right? That's what they're praying for. And, and Jesus is like, I'm standing right here. I'm standing right here before you again. Everyone now starts to ask, who is this Jesus? Where did he come from? Is he really who he says he is? Now in the end, the temple guards, the Pharisees that sent to arrest Jesus, right? They sent them out, and they said, go get him and bring him back. And they come back empty-handed. They don't arrest Jesus. And why? Because they say, no one has ever spoken the way he does. I mean, the things he's saying, I, I don't feel right bringing this man in. I don't know that what he's saying is wrong. It's kind of touching in my soul. It's kind of doing something to my spirit. They're almost bearing witness to Jesus. They're bringing a testimony to the Pharisees. Maybe you should, you know, listen to what he has to say. He's got some beautiful and important things to say. And it's met with derision. Well, clearly you don't know the law. And you're just as gullible and ignorant as those people out there. And a lot of you are under God's curse. Jesus' issue with the Pharisees was not the fact that they kept the law. Jesus was Jewish too. He kept the law also. He went to all the festivals. He worshipped in the temple. He observed all the things that he needed to observe. He was devout because he is, after all, the son of God. How is he going to throw religion out the window? He's not doing that. He doesn't have an issue with the fact that they keep the law. 
Jesus' issue with the Pharisees is that they have taken what God had given to people so that they would be able to live in right relationship with God and with each other, because that's the point of the law. Remember when it was given. They were coming out of slavery. They didn't know what it meant to be a people. They had overlords that took care of all that, that told them when to sleep and when to eat and when to work and when to do whatever, right? But now they would have to be their own people, and God gave them the law to help them so that they would live correctly in relationship with each other, to take care of each other, right? That's why Jesus could summarize the entire law by saying, love God, love your neighbor. And they had lost sight of that. They had turned it instead into a means of division, creating a whole us and them thing, right? And with God, there's no us and there's no them. It's we, right? There's no us, there's no them. It's we, we. But they had created this division between those who knew and followed the rules and did it right, did it really right, and then to those who did or could not keep the law at all. Keep the, keeping the rules were done for the sake of keeping the rules, not for the sake of the one who gave the rules, for the sake of forming community or for lifting people up and bringing them together. It became all about catching people out for not doing what they were supposed to do instead of using it to, to bring the people together, to help them to know God, to love each other, to love God, to do all the things, right? That's what it was about. And now we meet Nicodemus again. You guys remember Nicodemus, right? He's the, he's the Pharisee who came in the dead of night the last time Jesus, the, the second time Jesus was in, two times ago, when Jesus was in Jerusalem. He came in the dead of night to come and hear what Jesus had to say. Right? He wanted to learn what Jesus was about. Wasn't ready to do it out in the open, but he was curious, and he came, and he sat, and he listened. And now he's the one who seems to stick up for Jesus to his friends, because he's one of the Pharisees. You know, he's, he's also a smart man who knows the law and follows the law and does all the things, right? He's a teacher, he's a, he's a knowledgeable, wise man, and so he sticks up for Jesus. He points out that his friends are, in fact, actually breaking the law, in their attempts to discredit and silence Jesus because he says, our law doesn't judge someone without first hearing him and learning what he is doing, does it? They're refusing to do that. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to learn anything. He's got nothing to teach them. He needs to just be quiet. Is how they feel about it. Nicodemus, however, had taken that time to listen and to learn. And something was growing within him. He might not have been ready at this point to take it public, he wasn't pushing back awfully hard. He didn't really defend Jesus, but he, he was starting to like, you know what, what we are doing may not be okay. I don't know if I'm okay with this. He's getting uncomfortable. Now Nicodemus is met with insults too, and perhaps one of the, ooh, that's a mean insult. Are you from Galilee too? Ooh, ouch. Because we read in a lot of the Gospels where, where people will say, can anything good come from Galilee? People did not regard the Galileans very well, so... This is kind of a, a snide remark against Nicodemus. And they say, look it up. The prophet does not come from Galilee. Don't you read the Bible? You, you should know these things. Our unbiased and convictions can so easily blind us to any truth that does not fit with our own narratives. I mean, we know what we know, and that's the end of it, right? But I have to agree with Joan Chittister. I like Joan Chittister. She is a, um, she is a nun in the Benedictine order, and she, she wrote about knowing God. It, it was a talk called God, to, God in 2000. She was asked to speak, and so she wrote a talk, and part of what she said is, it is precisely our idea of God that is the measure of our spiritual maturity. What we believe about God colors everything we do in the name of God. Ooh. Everything we think about other people and everything we determine about life itself. That's some powerful words right there. In other words, what she's kind of saying is if we create God in our own image, then God will hate all the people we hate. God will judge all the people we judge. And, and God will always be in agreement with us. But if we can allow ourselves to be created in the image of God, which is really the way it's supposed to go, 
then we will realize that God calls us to look beyond that which we think we know so certainly, to embrace wonder, to stand in awe as God transforms our lives inside and out until God is the life within us and we see the world and the people in it through God's eyes. Eyes not of judgment and scorn, but of compassion and of grace. Who is Jesus to you? I invite you to sit with that this week. I think that's always a good question to ponder. I sit with that all the time. Who is Jesus to me? Jesus was sent into our world to save it, to bring light and truth to all people. Life abundant. Grace upon grace. Jesus came so that if we knew his heart and his commitment, we would also know the heart and the commitment of God, because he came to reveal God in his person. To believe in him is to come to him, and then to abide in him and he in us, so that we become one with him as he is one with God. So that who Jesus is, is who we strive to be as we live out our faith in him. And that can look all kinds of ways, right? But it's basically, in a nutshell, to love as he loves, to see people and meet them where they are, just where they are, with compassion and grace, because that's where how we were met, just as I am, with compassion and grace, the Lord loved me. To recognize that we are beloved by God, and because we are so deeply loved, we desire to love what God loves and seek the good and abundance for all that we seek for ourselves. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 through 8 says, Happy are those who trust in the Lord, who rely on the Lord. They will be like trees planted by, by the streams whose roots reach down to the water. They won't fear drought when it comes. Their leaves will remain green. They won't be stressed in the time of drought or fail to bear fruit. Friends, may we be like those trees planted by the rivers of living water so that we will bear fruit in every season. May we drink of the living water that Jesus offers to all so that we might know him for who he is and so know God for who God is. The God who loves this world and will never give up on it. And then, may we be transformed into a new creation, born of water and the Spirit, to become who God is calling us to be, and to become channels through which that life-giving water may flow through us and into the world by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you to get your hymnals and to turn to hymn number 400 as we stand in body or in spirit to sing, Come, Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
of Christ enliven us yet again on this day. May the God in whose name he came be glorified through our lives. And may the Holy Spirit make us to know who we are because of who Jesus is. Grant, O Lord, that what has been said with our lips, we may believe in our hearts, and that what we believe in our hearts, we may practice in our lives. In the name of your Son, who gave us the living water. Amen and amen. Thank you.